of mind. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, how is everybody tonight? Good. Great. Excellent. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, my name is Dan Ruley from Ontario Mine Rescue. Uh, I'm actually uh, based uh, here. My station is here in a uh, little town called Delaware, right in the center of southwestern Ontario, all about 20 minutes west of London. Um, I, uh, well, I used to work with Jay, or well, we used to work at the same plant, and uh, I actually met Jay. Uh, in Mine Rescue, uh, we both volunteered for the Mine Rescue team at uh, Canadian Gypsum. And uh, he reached out to me uh, last month, I think it was, and uh, asked me to do a, a little uh, presentation for you. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, I actually have a, a short PowerPoint, uh, just basically a, a, an introduction into Mine Rescue or Ontario Mine Rescue. And uh, I've got a short little uh, case study at the end of it uh, you might be interested in it just gives you a little bit of an insight uh, as to what our uh, what we're all about so on so um, if uh, everybody's okay with that I can get started I'll share my screen how's my voice for everybody can everybody hear me Okay. Yeah, it sounds good, Dan, here. Awesome. Okay, so, uh, well, I, I I know a couple of you have mentioned uh, Ontario Mine Rescue in the news uh, this week or this past week. Uh, we've been fairly busy up north with uh, uh, evacuation of the mine. Um, that mine was a uh, Totten mine in, uh, in Sudbury. It's one of our valet uh, properties um all uh all went very well with that one uh like i was telling jason before it was more of a routine evac uh is just uh, uh coming up from from that depth was uh, a little bit challenging uh but it actually uh employed the use of a lot of our high angle rope gear i think uh we all sent uh, everything that we had north and uh, uh it ended up uh, doing okay with that so um, so a little bit of an introduction into mine rescue here. Um, oh no, there we go. So if you look at, uh, Ontario as a whole, we have, uh, several districts, uh, in Ontario that we take care of, uh, basically, uh, the one uh, that I take care of is everything south of uh, uh, Perry Sound. Uh, of course, there's only three mines down here in Ontario or southern Ontario. Um, but we have uh, about 39 mines altogether that we take care of. So we have uh, stations in each district. So mine just happens to be right here in Delaware. Um, so they're more of a base office and uh, so we'll, we'll keep uh, uh, equipment stored or, or centrally located if we need it to uh, bring to the mines. So um, there's a shot of uh, one of our key pieces of equipment. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's a ChemGuard foam machine. Basically, it's a um, big uh, diesel powered uh, driven uh, foam <laughs> generator. So if we need to... Uh, employ that in an indirect fire attack underground we can uh, hook this thing up to fire hose and uh, make a lot of foam for a nice big bubble party underground so, um some other stuff we're into uh so we we uh you know i think you'll see some of this stuff here you'll you'll recognize some a lot of our uh hand tools or uh hydraulic uh, so auto extrication equipment um so we do uh we do have uh, quite a few sets of those located around the province uh, for uh, our volunteers to use underground as well. All right. Um, thermal imaging equipment. Uh, so we have uh, we employ the use of that not only uh, handhelds but on uh, vehicles as well. 
Uh, great for uh, our team searching for missing people and or the seat of a fire. Uh, so this would be our bread and butter ticket here, uh, the BG4 apparatus. So um, this is be uh, provide the, our wearers for uh, oxygen up to four hours. If we uh, um, so need it, uh, if you can imagine, it's a little more than a, just a walk down the street for, for many of our volunteers. Uh, if you've listened to the news uh, um, this week, uh, you, you know how daunting a task it is just to get underground. Uh, travel times are fairly lengthy. Um, uh, I add smoke and fire or, or smoke and contamination to that environment. Um, you know, we need to have time. So basically our, uh, I'm going to, I'll tell you our, our max mission time is about two hours, but, uh, we have that, they have that safety net of another two hours, uh, after that. Oh, this stuff. So we've got, uh, we do quite a bit of training in emergency rope gear. So high angle ropes. Um, Jason, if you recall our old style, uh, we've since tripled the, the gear to put be put with that. Um, that's actually some good shots here for those wondering. Um, so not only do we have the seven districts, but we have a, uh, a what we call substations at every mine. So currently we have uh, 39 substations. Uh, so usually one per active underground mine site. So again, it's a, it's a place for muster. Uh, we store our, uh, our rebreathers there and any other uh, equipment, first aid equipment, firefighting, everything would be centrally located in that station on site. And that station is regularly audited uh, every month. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and it would be our base of our communications as well. Oh, just a couple of shots of the stations we have here in the south. The, uh, well, everything from stretchers, first aid gear. Um, we've sort of branched out into uh, carrying some more SCBA style apparatus. So like the ones that you guys use in the fire service. Uh, anything that we need, any type of consumable that we need to head underground with, uh, we'll store it here as well. So we have, uh, well, that number has changed a little bit. We have uh, probably over a thousand active mine rescue volunteers across the province now. So um, mine, Ontario Mine Rescue, uh, Mine Rescue for every mine site is provincially legislated. So um, even though it's volunteer, uh, the mine site to operate has to have a certain amount of mine rescue volunteers available uh, to respond to an underground emergency. So we, we do quite a bit of training that way. Um, not too unsimilar to what we see in the fire service for volunteer halls. Many of our, uh, our volunteers are actually volunteer firefighters, uh, in, uh, in their respective districts. So, uh, so who do we look for uh, as a mine rescue volunteer? Naturally, anybody that, that is already a, a, either a, a local volunteer firefighter uh, with some type of back, background in EMS. Uh, obviously, uh, working at the mine or working underground is a, is a big, is a big um, added bonus. Uh, it's just, you know, if we can uh, get volunteers that are coming from that environment, they're comfortable in that environment. They know their way around and they have the, the skill and expertise to um, kind of uh, make their way through that mine. Uh, that's what we're looking for usually. Um, however, we will take surface employees as well, uh, just that they would be more available in time of need. So how do they get started? We have a five day, 40 hour mine rescue introductory course is basically our basic training. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, you know, a lot of that is uh, more physical uh, and also a baseline medical is needed for that. And once they're deemed fit, the lab will send them on a 20 hour standard first aid course. That would be the minimum standard. 
And they must also pass the course, uh, which teaches them basically to wear our bread and butter. So wear service and maintain the BG4 as well as basic mine rescue procedures. Uh, all of our volunteers must complete and pass six annual refresher sessions and obtain a FIT certificate from their physician annually, maintain their first aid certification, and re respond to emergency call-outs. Um, just talking about the training, so our training centers a lot around um, our actual scenario based, so they will as much as we can do it, uh, wear that uh, four hour rebreather, uh, perform a scenario, whether it be uh, uh, like a medical call or fire, entrapment, uh, you name it. Uh, and we'll, uh, it's, it's, it's all about getting them comfortable in that apparatus and in that environment. So just some stats, uh, I think we pulled these from uh, a couple of years ago. So our 2018-19 season, uh, you know, to get a to get an idea of how much training goes on, um, 730 basically eight hour standardized training refresher sessions. Uh, we had, we did 31 40 hour introductory courses. So basically that's, that's all new volunteers coming into the program. Um, we do, uh, we did 15 24 hour briefing officer courses and district competition training sessions, which are, um, that's our way of our, our, those are our standardized evaluations. So once we, you know, uh, get through our six training sessions a year per, per volunteer, uh, we'll do a, we'll hold a competition. Basically that's, it's not like your, uh, your normal uh, firefighter competition is nothing like that. It's uh, more of a responding to a mock scenario um, and right from start to finish, everything from field testing apparatus, wearing it, performing a you know, solution to a problem and uh, you know, right down to stripping down their apparatus, cleaning it up, function testing it and putting the mine rescue station back to emergency ready. Quite a bit of training goes on. Um, just to get an idea of some of the gear that we carry, uh, we have uh, 576 uh, breathing apparatus across the province that we maintain, um, 94 MX6 gas detectors, 32 sets of hydraulic tools, and 18 sets of rope rescue equipment, and the list goes on and on. Uh, so you get a an idea of, of our call out. So I know uh, 26 underground emergencies that year, uh, low frequency, but very high risk. Those would be our, you know, our big belt fires, uh, you know, multi-team responses. Um, so we like to keep that number low. Uh, it just reflects a low frequency, but like I said, it's, it's uh, it, they're usually high risk. Um, so some of our training or some of my training that we've had, uh, so emergency responder, that is, uh, we're going to be amping that up in the next few years to basically a basic life support uh, level. Uh, advanced high angle rope rescue, uh, we're all Drager 3 BG4 technicians. Advanced underground firefighting, hazmat level certification, and the list goes on. Um, even down to structural collapse. So, I mean, we had uh, the Godrich tornado uh, oh, a number of years ago now, uh, working with uh, QSAR out of Toronto. Um, that was an eye-opening experience for us. So, I mean, if that could happen, uh, we wanted to be more than ready the next time. Uh, we have a lot of remote mine locations in the north, uh, basically fly-in camps. So, I mean, the need for that type of, uh, or, some type of a remote emergency service to come in uh, is very difficult to do that. So uh, we're taking a lot of that training on ourselves now. So it's been working out well. Well, why do we do it? Uh, you know, I wish I had uh, all the info from the, uh, the latest uh, 
incident that we were watching in the news here, but uh, I do have another one here. Um, this is basically, this wasn't a fire scenario, but it was a uh, an entrapment uh, underground. I uh, actually was able to pull some live footage from uh, our case files here. Um, so just a warning, I mean, there's nothing major, but it is, uh, it is actual live rescue. So I'll uh, see if I can pull this up, see if it's going to work. I'm sure there'll be questions uh, after this. I don't know what our procedure is going to be after the PowerPoint, but um, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, we'll save them for after. Okay, so events leading up to this one, um, just going to paint the picture of, uh, you know, what led up to this. Uh, I'm going to have a, a little bit of a mining talk here. Um, so on the night shift of August 10th, 2018, production mayor Corey was assigned to remove blasted rock from a stope, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, 3,400 feet below surface at a mine in Kirkland Lake in Ontario. So what he was doing was using a remote capable two and a half yard scoop, which is basically a front end loader, exactly like the one you see in the picture. Um, so there's a, a layout of uh, the actual uh, location in the underground. So what we're looking at is a, a view from the top. So if you have a... Uh, a couple of drifts, tunnels, if that makes more sense to you. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, stope is what the, we would call an ore body. So they're extracting ore out of the stope. I mean, it could be uh, two feet wide up to, you know, 150 feet wide. So it just depends on the size of the ore body that they're uh, trying to extract and bring to surface. So if we look at how they do that, um, any type of ore body underground. Oh, I lost my. Uh, there we go. So anytime they're trying to extract an ore body underground, they'll drive a. Ooh, I'm jumping around here. Okay. Hopefully we'll stay there. So what they'll do is they'll they'll mine a tunnel above the ore body and they'll mine a tunnel below the ore body. Uh, and then what they'll do is they'll drill holes from one tunnel down to the bottom. If everybody can see the the top one is called the drilling horizon and the drop rays and the bottom is called the mucking horizon. And what they'll do is they'll drill uh, holes, diamond drill holes, uh, the whole length of the open or the, the stope and then they'll blast a certain number of those uh, holes out or rings out and create like a, a big uh, gerbil feeder. And they'll actually uh, send a, a remote loader in, run by remote, and uh, start to extract. Is that If you can imagine uh, a bunch of broken rock, um, you know, there's several million tons sitting there. It's like a giant gerbil feeder. They just keep taking it from the bottom and they'll bring it back and throw it down an ore pass. So that's what this gentleman was doing. So sometime between the 11th and 12 midnight, production su su supervisor was notified. Scoop operator Corey had missed his two hour check-in. Uh, so the supervisor arrived at the, at the stope location to find the two, two and a half yard scoop running and actually buried 30 feet inside the stope and still running at full throttle. Well, there's just kind of like a location of uh, where the scoop was. And remember, this is 3,400 feet underground. Uh, supervisor could see the scoop operator's hard hat dangling by the lamp cord. Uh, I called out to the operator, but with the excessive noise of the scoop running, no response could be heard. And the supervisor assumed the operator had been fatally crushed and proceeded to report the situation to the management team on surface. So there's an actual picture of the scoop with the uh, fairly large rock fall on top of it. Uh, 
I could tell you that that rock is located right on top of the compartment where the operator um, would have been sitting. There's just a picture of the, well, we had to actually bring in a, uh, a spare scoop because what we were going to do is uh, hook onto that one and pull it out. So that's a, 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 an idea of what you're looking at inside the scoop operator's compartment. So the timeline continued. So at 2.39, Ontario Mine Rescue officers were notified that, uh, um, that Mine Rescue was required to perform a body recovery. And at 3.05, they gathered in the on-site and uh, with five volunteers headed into the mine to start devising a, a plan. So, um, so to kind of paint the picture again, uh, Ontario Mine Rescue's officers, they'll act as a, in an advisory role, you know, as subject matter experts, and they also ensure that any emergency equip equipment required by the teams is on site. Um, so they'll have jurisdiction to ensure that the teams are following proper uh, standards and procedures um, when using that. So, the actual mine management, the company management has jurisdiction over the emergency. And basically, like I say, until things go sideways. Uh, timeline again. So it's consultation with the chief mine rescue officer in Sudbury. So this was uh, because it was a body recovery. Um, things were moving kind of slow. Lots of time to prepare. Um, the two mine rescue officers and the team went down to just kind of get a layout of the scene see what they need to do to extract um, the scoop operator safely. Um, so they were dispatched to the stope. Uh, upon arrival to the scene, uh, I remember that the scoop tram was actually running full throttle. Um, it had since run out of fuel and they could hear cries for help coming from the operator's compartment. So, um, the video I'm going to show you is one of the mine rescue officers actually decided to attach his cell phone to a series of blasting poles so he, just to get a, a good idea of what was happening inside that stope uh, under the rock fall. So. Yeah. 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 So you can see it was uh, now it was it's a different plan altogether now because the uh, Corey was still alive. Uh, he's in and out of consciousness, was complaining, bleeding from the abdomen area, um, as well as being pinned in the operator's cab. Um, so due to the location of, uh, of the scoop uh, being inside the stope, there was still a, a high risk of uh, more uh, material falling down through that stope area and they had no idea how long because of if it was crush injuries that um was going on they would have to um act fairly quickly to get him out of that position uh, not only their chance of success was to try to roll the large rock from you know from off of quarry using a sling and another two and a half yard scoop uh, they were able to lasso the rock using blasting poles and slings. And additionally, they installed an anchor plate and pulley into the back, which we, you know, we would call the, our ceiling or our roof. Um, they could increase the pulling force while maintaining control. 
Well, there's a, a good a, a good picture of the afterthought there. Uh, they had uh, where they did successfully uh, remove the rock. Um, they were able to set up, use another scoop, pull the rock off of them, and uh, actually quite ingenious. I got to give those guys lots of credit for that. Well, that was the intention: is to roll the rock off of the scoop and then pull the scoop to a safe location to remove quarry. Uh, as they pulled the large rock, the last suit cable began to slip, so they had to stop. Uh, now they had no choice but to stop all movements, and if they continued to pull the rock, they risked having the cable fall off. Uh, the only chance was to send in. Uh, they made the decision to uh, quickly go in, and it was more of a snatch and grab at this point. Um, and he was safely boarded for transport to surface where... Uh, EMS or paramedics were waiting. Well, that was definitely a happy ending to that uh, episode. Uh, loaded in the ambulance and on surface and on his way back to his family. And uh, surprisingly, uh, you know, just a broken right arm and shoulder, multiple cuts. I mean, he uh, he definitely got off uh, on the lucky side. All right, so that's uh, the end of my uh, presentation there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But uh, I can let the host take over and, you know, any questions, uh, obviously. No you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself. I'll begin, Dan. Uh, in uh, training scenarios or any um, joint uh, training opportunities, do you liaise with the uh, EMS? And uh, obviously, because you're in these remote situations, uh, for example, uh, Orange Air Ambulance to fly from Kirkland Lake to get someone down to Sudbury or another major trauma hospital, uh, yes. do you have that, that uh, unified command where mine rescue, EMS, uh, fire department is that sort of how it would work yeah so uh, at every one of the mine sites we have a well we have a, a actually in my district we have a every district has a, a district emergency plan all the mines are listed so all of those numbers are are all included all the uh the services that are provided the contacts so um basically when that erp plan comes open um, all the appropriate people are notified and usually EMS will be either waiting on surface, uh, paramedics if we need them. Um, the, our, our issue most of the time, uh, Crispin, is, is, is that uh, paramedics won't come underground. We can't get fire underground, we can't get paramedics, so our teams are usually, you know, 30 to 40 minutes in care and control of that uh, casualty, so doing basic life support. So I mean, when when it's needed, yeah, the the mines will. Uh, they're usually an ambulance waiting on site. Um, it's it's uh, funny that you mention Orange. Um, yeah, we've had to actually institute that a couple of times in the last few years from remote camps. And do you, uh, as the mine rescue officers uh, situated throughout the province, do you have a uh, an ongoing? Is there any sort of reporting structure to say? How many active operations are going on? You mentioned across all the mine sites across Ontario. Do you know of you know that there will be work happening? You know, in this many percentage of the of the locations. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I, an active idea of how many people might be, or how many operations are going on across the province. Uh yes. Uh, are, do you mean actual callouts incidents? No, or just like on a on a. Daily basis, do you know that out of all the different locations that have access to go underground, this many are in active service right now? Uh, just oh, yeah. so you would know, okay, we need to be able to assemble resources to go to these places. Yeah. Right now, you mentioned down in the gypsum mine, maybe there's nothing happening in Southern Ontario at this time. Yeah, we, uh, we keep pretty close tabs on that. Plus we have a uh, mutual aid, uh, pretty extensive mutual aid uh, agreements across Ontario. So the mines will actually support each other. 
if needed. So we will know. I mean, I I, I travel to the mines every week, so I'm at, I'm in each substation weekly. So I mean, I get all of their updates. I do all of their audits, and um, so it's it's a pretty tight network, so to speak. Uh, if uh, and uh, when they do their annual fire drills, so they'll do three or four of those a year. And uh, it tests that system all the time. So we have since gone to, uh, we're out of the pager system. We're now uh, text messaging. So anytime there's an incident uh, anywhere in Ontario, um, that or I get a, a text on my phone where it is, what it is, and a phone number to call right away. Are there other questions from the membership? On behalf of the members of the Niagara District Firefighters Association, uh, which encompasses the Niagara region and Haldeman County, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Dan, for joining us tonight uh, to share a bit of your industry with us and to give us a better appreciation of what happens in the rest of the province. So thank you very much. Well, anytime. Um, like I was saying to Jay before, I, when uh, this whole COVID thing gets over with, uh, feel free to invite me down with, uh, with the truck and some gear and uh, we can even do some hands on. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Mr. President. Okay, moving on, um, communications. So I've got for communications, the following hall, hall dues were received. Uh, Fort Erie Fire, $300. Port Corbin Fire, $75. Wayne Fleet, $75. Thorold, $300. And Lincoln, $75. Can I have a motion to file this? Motion to file, Crispin Bottle McQueenston. Can I have a seconder? A second that, Joe Boivere. Roll in two. All righty. All in favor? I guess carried. <laughs> um, accounts? We don't have enough people there. Joe? Yeah. Accounts. I have nothing for accounts. Nothing for accounts? No. Okay. What about uh, treasurer's report? Our bank balance is $8,926.07. All right. Thanks, Jill. That'll be uh, put on file for the audit committee. Um, committee reports. So we'll st start with the striking committee. Uh, Crispin, you chaired that. Do you have a report? Yes, uh, Mr. President, I have a report. I will uh, share that report now. Excuse me. The report is as follows. The striking committee met on August 26th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. The committee members that were present were President Jason Mose, of Wayne Fleet, Jill and Kathy Beauvert, Crispin Bottomley, Michelle McCauley, Leanne Johnson, Mandy McIntyre, and Dennis Briggs Jr. Absent from the meeting was Don McCauley and Corey Barkman. The following is a list of committees and the respective chairpersons for the year 2021-2022. Audit, Doug McIntyre, Jim Bradley, Thorold II. Education, Isabel Bellin, from Niagara Falls 4. Crispin Bottomley, Historical, Queenston. Public Relations, Crispin Bottomley, Queenston, Mandy McIntyre, Haldeman 9. Trophies, Jim McKenney, Niagara Falls 6. Laws and Legislation, 
Mandy McIntyre, Haldeman, nine. Competition, Ron Timpson and Rob Timpson, Haldeman, one. Nominating, Leanne Johnson, Wayne Fleet. Membership, Dennis Briggs Jr., Haldeman, nine. Credentials, Corey Barkman, Niagara Falls, six. And 100th anniversary, Chair Crispin Bottomley, Queenston, Mandy McIntyre, Haldeman, nine, Vice Chair. Meeting, uh, the purpose of the striking committee is to reflect on the past year and to provide direction to the executive for the coming year. Growing concerns for our association. We're looking at possibly holding outdoor areas or offsite areas to host in-person meetings until we can begin to host monthly meetings at different halls. In the meantime, Zoom meetings will continue to happen until further notice until public health decision and local fire department decisions. We're looking into a reward system for the most new delegates to see if this will bring out more memberships and President Jason will have more information in the coming months. We'll be looking to get a permanent home for the filing cabinets which host our historical records for our association. If anyone can or has room at the various station, please contact myself. There are two small filing cabinets. Our 100th anniversary committee is looking for ideas and anyone would like to assist in ideas for the upcoming year, please uh, get in touch with the committee. We also ask if we can have assistance in hosting the Zoom meetings. Mandy McIntyre offered her assistance in hosting and chairing the virtual meetings. For education, if anyone has or knows a topic of a guest speaker and can arrange this, please pass on to Isabel Belen. She is doing a great job in getting the municipal chiefs to speak on various topics. I submit this report for your approval and make the motion to accept the striking committee. I, Don McCoy, make a motion to accept these minutes. I'll second, Mr. McCauley, Niagara Falls, six. Um, I can read Jim's report if you guys want. Just give me a second to pull it up here. Uh, past President Bradley is present in this meeting should he need to give it. Oh, okay. Jim, do you want to read your report? Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Jason. Mr. President. I, Jim Bradley, respect and submit this report for your information and approval. Over the summer break, both auditors have independently reviewed the Niagara District Firefighters Association book for the 2020 and 2021 fiscal year. I'm pleased to report to the membership that the association's accounts and records are complete, balanced, and mathematically accurate. On behalf of this committee, as well as all the members, all the membership, I would like to thank our treasurer, Jill Beauvert, for his thorough and sound presentation. I move to adopt this report. I second that from Christian Bradley to all station two. All right, that'll be put on file, I guess, for future reference. Thank you. Uh, that is um, a motion to be accepted. That is a motion, okay. Do we, do we have a motion to accept? A motion was made by Jim Bradley, second, uh, Thorold two, seconded by Christian Bradley, Thorold two. Okay, thanks, Christian. Sorry, my audio cut out there. Uh, all in favor then? Okay, carried. Uh, next report, I don't think Isabel's here, is she, for education? I didn't see her name on the list. is not present. Uh, we are still planning to have uh, the Fire Chief of Pelham present next month. Uh, we will submit information to the membership in the minutes. 
Thanks, Crispin. Uh, laws and legislation. I don't know if Mandy's here either, is she? Uh, no report. No report. Uh, membership. Dennis isn't here either. So I guess that's no report. Historical, Crispin. Yes, thank you. We will uh, contribute the historical record of the past annual meeting to our uh, filing cabinet. And we will be, uh, again, collecting historical information in preparation for our 100th anniversary next year. Thank you, Crispin. Um, public relations, Crispin again. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm proud to report that we have 452 uh, Facebook group members for the Niagara District Firefighters. And over the summer, uh, we reached a number of new followers on Instagram. We now sit at over 630 Instagram followers. Uh, the executive committee approved the renewal of a Zoom account for the calendar year 2021-2022. Uh, that bill will be submitted uh, when it is received to the treasurer. Good, thanks, Crispin. Uh, next up is uh, trophies. Jim, are you still our trophy guy? Yes, apparently I am. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, as a trophy report to all the last year, all the winners in the past, uh, keep all that COVID dust off of it get it ready for when we get back to normal again. Perfect, hopefully we get back to normal sooner than later. Uh, competition, we have uh, Ron and Rob Timpson. They're gonna carry on again, but I don't believe they're on this meeting, so no report. Uh, convention, I wrote down you, Don, because I think if we have a convention, it's going to your hall, right? Yes, it is. Everything is planned for the last weekend in June, if everything goes well. Um, more ideas to follow. The biggest thing is our school, um, live burn and search and rescue is on the table again. So that'll be our training and I'll have some more information um, moving forward. Perfect, thanks, Don. Uh, Nominating's up next is uh, Leanne. I don't see Leanne on here. Um, but if anybody knows somebody that wants to be second vice president for the association, please get a hold of Leanne and give her a hand this year because she doesn't uh, know everybody yet. And it was good of her to step up. Uh, regional chiefs, I don't know. Do you have anything from the regional chiefs, Don? No, I don't. No report. I'll just okay. be sharing the uh, the local uh, department's uh, fire prevention messages on our account to spread that information. Thank you, Crispin. Yeah, October is uh, fire safety month, so I guess all the all the info will be put out to the departments. Uh, credentials. Corey's not here. Do you have the credentials? I see there's only 15 people here, so. Yes, I do, uh, President. We have 15 life members, four delegates, two visitors, with seven departments represented with a total of 21. All right. Is there a silver helmet winner? Niagara Falls Station 6 with five uh, life members and one delegate. Thank you, Don. All righty, moving along. Uh, I just want to uh, mention we do have Thorold uh, two with two uh, delegates uh, in the room as well. So congratulations to Thorold Station Two, Thorold South. Yeah, that's a good point, Crispin. I know we're uh, short on people here. I'm hoping that we can get back to a normal meeting coming up. Uh, Crispin and I were talking before the meeting about possibly renting a hall, a Lions Hall, or something where we could maybe get in if everybody has their double vaccines, maybe we can have an actual meeting in person and get back on the road here, but we'll have to look into that a little further and see what the rules are. Um, does anybody have any unfinished business? I know we're into the new year here, so. All 
Nothing was moved forward, uh, President. All right. Um, next up is new business. Um, I have an go ahead. New business. Yep. Uh, was brought forward in the um, in the surveys uh, for items for uh, the committee or the association to consider, and that is the uh, planning of a uh, association member of the month. Uh, so members of the uh, executive and striking committee uh, have discussed uh, possibly bringing forward what the terms of reference might look like for that, but it is to recognize members of an association, uh, their activities for their independent association or what they do in their community, and then to be uh, submitted to the executive for review and have a monthly uh, recognition uh, for what's going on at the different stations and uh, to recognize members. Uh, these members may not necessarily be uh, life members or delegates, but the intention is to bring it to the association so they can uh, submit the, the top uh, names that they have, sort of a, a goal of a firefighter of the year or association member of the year uh, idea. Uh, we're still yet to work out all the plans, but we'll be presenting that at a future meeting. Thank you, Chris. I think it's a good idea recognize people in the uh in our community here for their good deeds not just as firemen but what they're doing in their communities as well so keep in mind if you have somebody that's doing something awesome in your your hall or whatnot they don't even have to be part of the association i believe right crispin um submit them forward and uh we'll see what we can do for them is there any other new business None. I guess we don't have any draws. Um, is there any announcements to be made? I just an announcement of congratulations to our second vice president, uh, Corey, on his engagement uh, this week. Yeah, congratulations, Corey. Don't uh, take the job at Disneyland as the fireman there. <laughs> Um, is there any other announcements, any, uh, raffles coming up for Thanksgiving or anything like that? Niagara Falls, you guys are always holding something. Yes. Niagara Falls station six, uh, advanced trick, advanced uh, tickets are out. Um, we have five series this year, November 19th, I believe. Um, uh, it's a virtual basically just passing, uh, drawing the names and, uh, passing the turkeys slash vouchers out to the winners can you uh pay by emt or transfer you guys money to get those or you gotta meet somebody in person we're trying well it's up to the individuals who are selling tickets if uh if you want tickets let me know and i'll get them out to you and uh or each station i can get uh tickets out or our association guys can get them out also so okay thanks don um, is there any other uh, announcements? None. So I see our next meeting will be Thursday the 28th. And as it is right now, it'll still be on Zoom unless something changes. If something changes where we can get a venue that we can meet at with a reasonable number of people. I'd like to see that happen again, but uh, we'll go from there. So if that happens, we'll email everybody out and let them know what the venue is, but try and get some more people out. I see we got a slow start this year on members. So hopefully we're not dwindling to nothing. Um, yeah. Can I make, uh, is there any other, anybody else have anything else they want to say here or before I adjourn the meeting? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Adonis Somerville Willoughby. Seconder. Mike Brian Wagter, Haldeman seven, Lowbanks. All righty. Carried. Thanks for coming out, guys. Who is from uh, Lowbanks? What's Brian Wagter. 
It's uh, it's 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 Brian Wagner, Alderman Seven, Low Banks. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Thanks, Brian, for coming over. <laughs> Alrighty, thanks guys.